Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third and final night of our eighth annual Equine Industry Symposium hosted by the University of Guelph Bachelor of Bioresource Management Equine Management students. My name is Hannah Hassan, and I will be your MC this evening. We thank you so much for joining us as we discuss what makes a successful business. The winner of last night's Schleza Saddle Fit gift certificate is Caroline Peck, and the winner of the gift certificate towards a Smart Cert massage course is Melissa Gibson. Congratulations to our winners. We will be contacting you by email for your prizes. Be sure to stick around until the end of the night when another opportunity to win these prizes will be presented. Special thanks to our sponsors, Acera Insurance, Equine Guelph, Smart Cert, The Rider, Schleza Saddlery, Canadian Horse Journals, and KX Radio. The symposium wouldn't have been possible without them and their wonderful support for this event. A reminder that the University of Guelph resides on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We recognize this gathering place where we work and learn is home to many past, present, and future First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Please note that videos and microphones for all attendees have been disabled. Throughout the night, please feel free to ask questions in the chat. Chat monitors are available to answer general questions, or if it is a question for a presenter, they will be read aloud during the Q&A session. Please note that rude or offensive comments will not be tolerated. This is the 8th Annual Equine Industry Symposium. The Equine Industry Symposium was started in 2016 and aims to increase knowledge about horses and develop important relationships within the equine industry. Discussing industry issues without primary reference to any discipline is something in which all members of the industry must engage. The Equine Industry Symposium is hosted by the Bachelor of Bioresource Management Equine Management students. The Bachelor of Bioresource Management BBRM program at the University of Guelph is Canada's first degree program to offer a specialization in equine management and combines a solid background in business, biological sciences, and equine management through practical and theoretical experience in biology, physiology, business, and horse behavior. The BBRM program provides students with the opportunity to gain skills and experience from accomplished faculty experts, as well as experience a hands-on approach to learning about the management of horses and equine industries and businesses. The equine management major includes courses such as equine event management, where students organize and host equine events, including the symposium itself. To learn more about the program or the University of Guelph, feel free to pop your questions into the chat. The topic for our opening night of the 8th Annual Equine Industry Symposium was Bridging the Labor Gap. We had a wonderful presentation from Dr. Kendra Coulter on the current state of the industry, where she set the scene for the rest of the two nights. We also had a discussion panel with students and graduates from our various equine programs on the theme of forward-looking hosted by Akash Maharaj. The topic for the second night of the symposium was boosting business efficiency. We had the opportunity to hear from Joel Lalonde on what makes successful business models and from Sean Jones on how to achieve succession planning. Tonight, we will be having an exciting panel discussion, what makes a successful business from the industry professionals themselves. The panelists will be speaking about what makes a successful business from their perspective in the industry. Leading our discussion is our wonderful facilitator, Dr. Kendra Coulter. Dr. Kendra Coulter is professor in management and organizational studies at Huron University College at Western University, a fellow of the Oxford Center for Animal Ethics and a member of the prestigious Royal Society of Canada's College of New Scholars, Artists and Scientists. She is globally recognized as the leader leading analyst of animals and work and has particular expertise on horses well-being and horse human work which she has studied in Canada, Sweden and the United States. She advises governments, law enforcement and non-profit organizations and writes widely for scholarly, practitioner and mainstream audiences. Her latest book is Defending Animals: Finding Hope on the Front Lines of Animal Protection which was recently published by MIT Press. In addition to her professional experiences and expertise, Kendra is a lifelong horsewoman and was on the back of a horse before she could walk, though these days she's more likely to be found giving treats and cleaning mud off ankles. We are so grateful she is here to facilitate this wonderful panel with panelists Bronwyn Wilton, Helen Richardson, Sean Jones, and Carl Lagerberg. I'll let you take it from here and introduce our panelists, Dr. Coulter. Thank you kindly, Hannah. It's wonderful to be here. We're going to be talking about business fundamentals with folks from all across different aspects of the equine industries, but I think more specifically, we're gonna be talking about people. And when we're talking about people and how we relate to each other, how we relate to horses. I think that will really be the core and the heart of, uh, of our discussion. So I'm gonna introduce the panelists. First off, we have Helen Richardson, a very experienced horsewoman who began riding at the age of 10 and like many of us knew it was her passion. She's an active equestrian Canada licensed and NCCP certified competition coach, as well as an EC NCCP master coach developer. And she actively coaches dressage and eventing at Oakhurst Farm in Ashton, Ontario, which is west of Ottawa. 
She also was doing some very interesting work with Ontario Equestria that I think will be very meaningful for participants today with respect to the new stable program. Uh, and I think she's going to tell us a little bit more about uh, that. But it's a really great resource, allowing people uh, to, 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 to learn, to network, to understand fundamentals that they might or almost certainly will need in the equestrian industry. And she's able to bridge an impressive background beyond the horse world uh, in, in, in tech, working for a range of companies from Jetform to Cold North Wind to Upchain uh, on, on tech dimensions and bridging these two worlds together. So we're really looking forward to hearing Helen's perspective. We're also delighted to have Carl Lagerbord with us, who's been part of the racing industry for as long as he can remember. Uh, and, and what started out as a groom position has grown into quite a career, uh, and most recently manager of stabling and then senior manager of racing operations and equine welfare at Woodbine Entertainment, which he, and he served in, in those roles for 19 years. He's moving on to an expansion position, a new and very interesting position at Overseas Horse Transport Limited, uh, working to, to ship horses internationally while always remembering to put their welfare first. And I think that's a key lesson for everyone. Delighted to have Carl with us. Thank you. Bronwyn uh, Wilton is a principal and lead consultant at Wilton Con Consulting Group. Her goal is to help others find creative solutions to complex problems and has extensive experience at the academy, so university contexts, working with industry stakeholders and leading and undertaking research. She has a PhD in rural studies, as well as a master of science in rural planning and a bachelor of science in agriculture from a little university known as Guelph, and has facilitated many workshops uh, and, and events. So we're delighted to have Bronwyn with us. Last but not least, Sean Jones, who uh, has an interesting career, has worked as past general manager and head trainer of the Palm Beach Riding Academy. Uh, so knows firsthand what the difficulties of, of running a business in the equine and agricultural industries uh, and, and currently is advisor at Sun Life. Uh, so is dedicated to helping uh, those around him and clients, community members grow their businesses and, and manage the busyness of day to day life, which is certainly a reality in the equine world. So very pleased to have Sean with us as well. So perhaps to get things rolling. Each of the panelists could begin by concisely. I don't. Sometimes we really get we get rolling, but in a couple of minutes, could you tell us in your own words about your trajectory and what led you to uh, the role that you're in now? So maybe we will start in um, reverse order and to start with Sean. Uh, thanks, Kendra. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, currently I'm a I'm an advisor with Sun Life, and I'm I'm sort of taking that role mostly because I operated a very successful equine operation in Florida for a long time, but quickly realized that no matter how successful I was, I wasn't building up personal assets the way that normal people do, normal business people do. So I got into the education space through Sun Life uh, with that purpose in mind was the ability to to reach out to other equestrians and say, look, you know, normal people have a defined contribution pension plan, have an RSP, have a TFSA. They're saving 10% of their paycheck, their 20% of their paycheck, every pay for retirement. Um, and it was a strong point that I made last night was that as an equestrian, there's a lot of pull on our money. There's a lot of outgone for our income. And usually that involves going into fixing fences, buying new jumps, buying a new truck, fixing the trailer, a new horse, a new saddle, whatever. But none of it ever goes into the pocket of the business owner. So I'm on a bit of a crusade into trying to educate equestrians how to do that uh, in a digestible manner, especially I think it's relevant considering cost of living right now, uh, inflation so on and so forth. So I think uh, everything we're talking about is relevant and impactful. So I appreciate uh, the the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Thank you. We're pleased to have you back for a second night. Why don't we jump to Bronwyn? Sure. Thanks, Kendra. Uh, so great question. So my career has been a little bit like a, a monkey gym, sideways and upwards and down again and <laughs> sideways and up again. Uh, so so when I was uh, doing my PhD, I was involved with horses for a long time. When I did my undergrad, I 
paid for uh, some of my rent by riding racehorses at a local home track and things like that. So it kind of did the whole barn rat work for work for rides on horses as I was going through school. Then when I was doing my PhD, uh, my kids were, I had three young kids when I was doing my PhD and where they were very involved in pony club. And so we were actively engaged in pony club world and doing all that fun stuff. And I was working away at my PhD, particularly looking at farmland protection policies in Ontario. And so I had a whole bunch of interest in ag and rural uh, on the side and the social structure of rural communities and things like that. And then one day my advisor or one of my advisors said, if you would just do something on horses, you'd probably get this PhD finished in a hurry. So I switched gears a little bit and did a project on my PhD thesis actually on the equine sector. This was a while ago now and uh, looked at the how the equine sector uh, interacted with the environmental and social side of rural communities. And it was very interesting and uh, a group that nobody at Guelph, I was working with a uh, professors across the environmental science uh, school and rural planning. At first, one of them was like, you're going to look at dude ranches. And I was like, no, not dude ranches. <laughs> Looking at there's a pretty big sector out there and across the province and across Canada. And uh, so we did an interesting study just looking at how um, horse farm owners in particular view things like environmental stewardship of the farm and and like that. And uh, that spun out into some workshops we did with conservation authorities on managing uh, healthy landscapes for healthy horses, which was a lot of fun. And, and then uh, I moved on to my career in terms of, and where I'm doing now is consulting uh, in the agriculture industry, but every now and then we get the, to do a project on horses in the equine sector. And, and that's really fun when that happens. And so then I take kind of that research and stakeholder engagement skill set gained from other parts of my work and can apply it to the horse sector, which is good. And that's what we did this past year with the question Canada with a national study on the equine sector in Canada. So, so yeah, I'll stop there. So thank you. Very interesting. I think you're both Gryphons. This sort of strange mythical creature yes. that tends to circulate in the equine world a fair bit. And I say that as a Mustang. Very, yeah. very, very reasonable. <laughs> okay. Very, very reasonable. Carl, let's hear from you. Thanks, Kendra. So I grew up in the industry. Uh, my parents worked with the thoroughbreds at Woodbine, and I was six years old when I first went there. And so I could groom a horse by the time I was 10, you know, just started all that and uh, thought I'd take a year off from high school and went to work for Roger Ratfield, who was a Hall of Fame trainer, groomed a, qu a Queen's Plate winner very luckily back in the 80s for him. And my life kind of got set from there. I went on to be an assistant trainer for 10 years for another top horseman, Mac Benson. And uh, then I wanted to change and make a change in the industry. So I actually applied for a job with Woodbine and spent the next 19 years working between the stable office for 15 years in different roles and then taking on senior manager of racing operations and adding equine welfare to my role in the last couple of years. All very important to me. Um, I've hired many people that are managers today in the racing department and uh, it's a great department to work with. And now I'm on to the next role, which is uh, working with overseas horse services. And it's something that I've been working with um, two different companies over the last 15 years and overseas has been the last few years, bringing in international runners for the major races in, at Woodbine. And it's always interested me and an opportunity became available. So that's my next step in life. i am uh, definitely got quite a few years left of work in me and uh, look forward to the next step. And I have to say thanks to Sean and Sun Life because I definitely have a very good pension from Woodbine that I have for retirement. So that's a very important thing that I should mention that now. Pensions Thank in you. the horse world. What a wild idea. Let's talk more yeah. about those and spread that love around. Helen, could we hear from you? Yeah, so I'm Helen Richardson. Thank you very much for having me here this evening. I grew up in Ottawa, west of Ottawa. And I kind of, I grew up with a family that was involved in tech software development. So I always sort of worked in technology. Um, I actually did English in school. So I was planning to be some sort of writer or use that English degree, which is not actually what I do with most of my life. Uh, but I started writing when I was 11 after begging my parents for a year or two and trying to convince them that my sister and I would not be figure skaters. That was not our destiny we were gonna ride horses and eventually did what a lot of people who start in the sport do we we got our own farm i got certified as a coach when i was about 20 years old and i'm still working as a coach and i've sort of transitioned from 
my day job with writing as a hobby to actually making writing my full-time job. And part of the reason for me is as a coach, I tend to go out and, and meet a lot of students and, and have a lot of experiences with, with kids and adults in the sport that are really fascinating, fun experiences that they might not have somewhere else. And occasionally I'll go out to dinner with my husband, who's not a horse person, um, and we'll meet people that I don't know. And they most often ask what I do. And I say, why well, I coach kids riding horses. And I always get the story, oh, you ride horses. I rode a horse once I was kicked, bitten, bucked off. Horses are scary. I never want to do that. And for me as a coach, knowing that this is an early start, incredibly late specialization sport. It's a sport that people can still engage in in their 70s and 80s in whatever way they want to. I find hearing those things very troubling. I want people to have good experiences in the sport. So it's really turned for me into a passion to create better coaches and better businesses in the industry so that people can have that first positive engagement in the sport that lets them continue in the sport for as long as they want to. So with Ontario Equestrian, we're building the new stables program, which is really to build a collaborative community to share what are the best practices in the sport, in the industry for keeping horses, for teaching people to ride, for introducing people to the sport and for developing athletes over the long term? And I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of bright light in the future of this sport, and I'm excited to be part of it. Thank you. It's really interesting here from all of you. And what I, I think is a theme that cuts across all of your remarks and all of your career journeys is actually something that I often teach students, which is about opportunity. You need to take opportunities, but you also need to make and or create opportunities. And I'm hearing that across all of you, which is that sometimes things are presented to us, maybe unexpected. Um, and, and if we seize that moment or that chance, that can be really beneficial. Simultaneously, we may feel like we're butting up against walls or, or really frustrated are spinning our wheels and need to work and create or innovate or think outside the box. I'd like to ask, and, and I welcome any, maybe at least two, at least two of you to answer this, which is, was there a challenge that really stands out as you reflect on your career that was, was noteworthy and, and quite frustrating? And how did you overcome it? I would welcome any of you to respond to that. I can start off, Kendra. So, uh, yeah, there are many challenges in the in a career path, and uh, I like what you said about making opportunities and taking those opportunities. I agree 100% with that. That you kind of have to keep your uh, yourself open to new opportunities and things. And and I would say when um, when I was doing my PhD, it was very challenging because I was raising three kids, <laughs> running around doing all that. Um, but to have the idea of doing something focused on horses, which I loved and loved the horse sector and being taken seriously with doing that at the time, because I was in a program where people were doing all sorts of very serious philosophical things. And I was just wanting to do something very pragmatic and very interested in a topic I loved so much. Um, so I think just believing that it would work and that there was a piece of it that would make sense from kind of that academic perspective that I was in at the time and then also for the um, sector and I think I always was really interested in applied research and kind of things that like participatory research and uh, and trying to do something that was a little bit more uh, pragmatic in a PhD program was a little was a challenge and certainly some I had some people faculty in the department uh, right not very inspiring and things like that on proposal documents and stuff so so yeah it wasn't all sunshine and roses all the time but it, it really turned out to be a good project and then it was set me up for other opportunities in life and and to have that spin-off where we did those workshops with horse farm owners and conservation authorities to kind of connect around some of the things you could be doing for the environment on your horse farm was really rewarding. So yeah, there was a challenge, but then it was uh, turned out to be work out really well in the end. Wonderful. I think Sean might have some insight. I mean, I've got a lot to say about overcoming challenges in the horse industry. I mean, that's, that's a day-to-day -day living or occupation, right? Um, I'm going to actually make reference to a question that was asked last night when you know somebody had asked about how do I get into the sport if I don't have the capital to purchase a property and I said well you know coming from Wellington most professionals down there don't own their properties they actually leased their properties so I leased a property just north of Wellington 
um, full scale operation, we had a, a beautiful thing going, but the ownership shifted a little bit. So there was going to be an eventual termination of my lease. So talk about a challenge. I had, you know, 35 horses, busy show barn, but now we're gonna have to relocate. So uh, creating a challenge. So what I ended up doing is getting in touch with the owners of the winter equestrian festival at equestrian sport productions and saying can i move my operation onto the showgrounds and they're like sure why not we'll just call it the palm beach riding academy it's all yours so talk about making your opportunity could have been a disaster turned out to be quite a quite an awesome opportunity for my clients because now my clients are riding lessening in the same rings that we're showing in every day and it just happens to be the winter equestrian festival showgrounds um so i guess when things start to present to be a bit of a challenge in the horse business and they will daily i don't want to be cliche and say think outside the box but sometimes you know there's no way to fix that terminating lease think about something different how about i go somewhere completely different and do something that maybe someone hasn't thought of and see what happens there. So yeah, that's my thought. That was great, uh, Sean. And I totally agree. You got to be creative, especially in this industry. And I think in any industry, um, I just wanted to jump in and, and say, you know, I was having a discussion with a student recently about where I am now and what I'm doing now. And I'm working for Ontario Equestrian and I'm developing the stables program and I'm coaching the coach developers who coach coaches. And if I had decided to do that at 18, I would have been able to do it for 20, 30 years already. Don't do the math. I'm 52. It's fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but I think if I had known that this was an opportunity and a pathway for me at 18, I wouldn't have known how to get there. It's taken all the life experience that I have to be where I am now, to be doing the projects I'm doing and being passionate enough about them. And I think if I had tried to draw a direct line between where I was and what I wanted to be when I grew up, I might not have figured it out. Um, I've always complained that I don't know what I want to be when I grow up and I keep trying all these different jobs. And now I've sort of started realizing that I don't have to be one thing. And in this industry, we all wear a lot of hats. We do a lot of different things. And like Sean said, we can be creative and find a way to be involved that works for us at the time and in the place that we have um, and keep working towards what those goals are. But sometimes we don't even know those are goals until we've spent a little time in the industry and figured out what's out there and what we're doing and what we like. Um, I always said I wouldn't be a teacher and now most of what I do is teach coaches to coach. So I guess I am a teacher, but yeah. To echo Helen, I think setting yourself goals and uh going forward like as you know and i've changed many jobs over the years but i've always told everybody that i've worked with and who's worked for me younger people you know going to universities and speaking at career fairs um don't just settle for this is what i i think i'm going to do because you never know what it can lead to the positions out there in the equine industry and everywhere and we're all sitting here today with different jobs and different vocations and you just look at it and you say okay you know what we are headed this way but something when one door closes one door opens you never know which way it'll lead and at the same token everybody if you're always going forward and you're always showing what you have and how much you care about the industry you're always going to find that right spot very well said and that has inspired my next question Helen and Carl, I feel like you, you sort of answered this. If you want to answer it again a slightly different way, please do. Or if we want to leave it for Bronwyn and Sean, that's okay too. What is one piece of advice you wish you'd been given that you would now give to others? I could be really quick on that and just say, um, you know what, just keep leaving yourself open to new experiences in the industry as, you know, I've spent an entire lifetime in the thoroughbred industry and now I'm switching over to something that's going to be all different breeds. It's just not thoroughbreds flying across the country, across North America and the world. It's all different breeds. Um, next year's Paris Olympics, quite exciting. There's Spruce Meadows and this company, they fly horses of every type. So I think just be prepared for that next step. You never know what it's going to lead to. 
totally with you, Carl. And the best piece of advice I did get from my dad when I was 18 and I was waffling about school and what I wanted to do because I wanted to hurry up and get working so I could afford to show more. Um, my His piece of advice was just do something. Don't ever get stuck doing nothing, trying to make a decision. Do something and at least you'll figure out things you don't like um, on the way to figuring out the things that you do like. For me in this business, communication. Uh, we have a tendency to be competitive against other facilities, other coaches, other students. But at the end of the day, we're all trying to create better humans riding better equines. And we need to communicate and share what's working so that we can grow the industry and the sport and do better. I can jump in uh, here and just say uh, relationships. I think relationships are critical and the, the world runs on relationships. So I think uh, just understanding that every person you meet is somebody you should get to know and and understand what they're where they're coming from and and just build on those relationships throughout you know your life and the coaches you meet and the uh, other competitors like Helen just said it, it, it can be a competitive uh, sector so instead of competing against each other how can you help lift each other up and how can you help uh, support the sector as a whole and uh, I think that's one of the things in our study uh, one of the overwhelming findings and we surveyed over 4,000 people across the Canadian equine study or equine sector was that horses are good for people so if that's and I think we all probably agree with that intuitively so if horses are good for people how can we as the people involved with the horses help each other as well so I think those uh, that relationship building not only for uh, supporting each other but also for good business sense so if if at some point you start your own business, you could reach back to somebody you met at some point in your life and say, hey, you, you had a cool business there. Could you give me a few tips on what I should do and things like that? So, so yeah, I would uh, say the best advice is build and foster good relationships with uh, as many people as you can. Pretty good segue, because actually before everyone was talking, that's sort of what I was going to say. And my experience in Wellington the dynamic down there is incredible. And, and what I mean by that is you have, it's the most saturated environment for professionals. There's, there's an equine professional everywhere. Um, but everyone's got their little, their lane, their niche in the marketplace. There's a, there's a top pony trainer, top big act trainer, pop, top junior jumper trainer, uh, child adult hunter trainer type of thing. The barn down the road is not your competitor. They're your colleague. Clients come and go. Pros are, will always be there. So don't think of them as your competitor. Think of them as your friend. And what I noticed a lot of is that someone's pony rider who decided to go buy a junior jumper, well, that pony rider would train with the pony trainer with the pony and then go to the junior jumper trainer to train with the junior jumper. In fact, a, a, a very good friend of mine who's a top Grand Prix rider had me train her daughter weekly uh, to fine tune her equitation because that just wasn't the Grand Prix riders forte. It was a beautiful dynamic. Um, but from the outside looking in, you kind of go, well, aren't you guys competitors? Well, no, not really. You're not. We're working together for, you know, the uh, rising tide floats all boats type of thing, right? Um, and once you accept that paradigm in this industry, man, we're going to make some huge progress. So stop looking at, your, at the barn down the road like they're your enemy and start working together. Very interesting. And I think that theme cut across all of your comments. Not only do we work with people, we work with horses and they are the heart uh, and, and soul of what we do and, and the most important stakeholders in all of this, because our decisions are always affecting them on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's a challenging context that we're in, in terms of rising costs, um, in terms of extreme weather, in terms of uh, the impact that things like droughts and floods are having on hay crops and, and, and sort of the basics of, 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 of horse welfare and equine welfare, um, never mind anything even higher in terms of uh, horses' well being. In terms of looking ahead and recognizing the challenges of this context, what do you think will be the most important areas for people who are committed to horses' well being to be paying attention to? Or where could there be some new opportunities for us not only to tread water, but uh, to, to rise above? You know, the other three people on the call or are, are on the panel are more deeply involved in the horses on a day-to-day -day basis. But uh, a few trends that we saw through the study and just in general across the agriculture and rural sector as well is a rising cost of land and the risk of urban sprawl continuing to 
uh, kind of eat into the land that's appropriate for horse uh, activities. So that that's something to kind of keep an eye on. And, you know, as we were discussing in our study, it's like um, some people were saying, well, that's not the horse industry's problem in terms of urban sprawl and things. There's nothing we can do about it. And I was like, well, no, there is a lot you can do about it because you can advocate as an industry for good farmland policies. And also with that, in terms of uh, just collaborate with the agriculture sector a little bit more. So you're kind of part and parcel together horses need the ag sector for hay and the grains and sometimes the sometimes large animal vets are shared between across um, livestock um, so look, those are things you can think about in terms of how do we work with other sectors that also need this land base and need to protect kind of the agricultural land and that so that'd be something um, biosecurity I think is an important issue that came through very clear in our study uh, need more training more knowledge more research on biosecurity and how to prevent the spread of diseases through through it through the herd so that'd be important to think about as well and then uh, I think climate change too is an interesting one to it might seem a little bit separate from the horse sector from at times but if you think about extreme weather events like you mentioned and our barns it ready for an extended like 20 day heat wave or something like that are we equipped and ready to kind of make sure the horses stay comfortable and healthy and and thrive when weather might become more unpredictable so those would be three things that i i think we could be looking ahead to for the future just to carry that on you know having been the equine welfare person at woodbine um it's very important just to keep an eye on all on all the industry and uh, i said it's like I, i'm learning you know i'll be dealing with their with other breeds but in the racing industry you know just watching everyone um and it's not that you're looking for anything you're just ensuring that all rules and regulations are met you know in the safety of horses and the agco has their rules and regs but woodbine has its own idea of how to ensure that horses are kept safe and uh you know what the industry itself the trainers are always making sure of everything and woodbine as a whole, and I say that um, the racetrack and the horse people are very proud of the the numbers that they have for horses that have not got hurt and everything, and you know across North America and Tapita being one of the safest racetracks, um, they have you know three racetracks to the the Taylor Turf Course, the Inner Turf Course, the Tapita. They train on dirt. They can train on various tracks. It's kept everyone safe. And I think equine welfare is such an important thing because we want people to know that all horses are kept safe in racing. And at the same token, I think across all the sports, um, when you show show jumping, everything, it's all about showing everyone that horses are the number one priority and everyone is out there to keep them safe. So I echo Bronwyn in a lot of things that she says. My, I'll take this a whole different direction and say broke horse operations owners can't keep their horses in great shape so raise your rates right we have peak and we had peak inflation in 2022 went up eight percent in canada did your rates go up eight percent yes you mentioned you know with droughts and so on and so forth hay prices are going up everything's going up but equine operation owners haven't increased their fees where's the consequence in that possibly the welfare of your animals I mean, I'd hate to say it, but I mean, in order to take care of your horses uh, to peak performance and to maintain a strong welfare mandate, you got to make enough money to be able to do that. So um, and you're going to hear me say this for a long time. I'm on this crusade. I think everybody in this industry needs to be aware that we've got to increase our fees for services uh, to match at least match inflation. Um so that we at least get to a point where god forbid we ever have another covid episode and barns get shut down at least they've got a buffer to still take care of their horses i mean i hate to always bring it back to finance because i'm a financial advisor but i mean that's my that's my wheelhouse so there we go i knew sean was going to come out with the money stuff i'm not good at that so thank you for covering that side um i am going to talk a little bit about during the pandemic uh with OE, we found very quickly, and it was almost shocking how quickly people were in distress. Um, and that's due to them not listening to Sean and doing that financial planning and really preparing for those times when things are lean. There have been a number of programs introduced by 
Equine Guelph by Ontario Equestrian to really help provide opportunities to grow your business and to understand how to run your business more efficiently. Um, you know, the Rookie Riders program, which is a fundamental education program for kids riding, takes out some of the horses and minimizes the use of your school horse load while still teaching people the fundamental riding skills using barrels, using gymnastics equipment, um, allowing you to bring more beginners into your facility and move into the equestrian programs. And the difficulty right now is for people to see those programs and understand how to incorporate them to create a different stream of revenue than maybe the revenue they have. So really, you know, sometimes it, we have a habit in this sport of doing things the same way we've always done them because that's how we do them. And I have had literal almost fights to the death with coaches over what, well, but you have to mount from the left. The only reason we all get on a horse from the left is because you don't want to stab yourself in the foot with your sword. I've literally only seen one person ride with a sword in our barn. So I don't think that's a valid reason to always do things the same way. We tend to stick to tradition and we're not always willing to open up and look at being creative and finding change in, and creating new opportunities. And I would encourage any barn owners out there to communicate find out what's happening with other barns that is working and look at the programs being offered by the different bodies that are available in the province and across the country, because there are programs that can help improve the business that you have and grow it to a different level. Um, yeah, so all those are such great points. And that's, that's funny, the getting on from the left. So true. Um, so I want to pick up on what Sean said, because this did come through in the uh, study we did that financial literacy and that financial um, management of the horse business is not a strong point for the sector and it needs to be stronger. And uh, so we had, because we often, we do most of our work in the agricultural sector, we um, came up with uh, two programs that are very successful in the ag sector with Farm Management Canada and the Canadian Agricultural Human Resources Council and trying to see if the equine sector, so we have one of our recommendations was start to collaborate more with that ag sector and those two organizations in particular because they have programs and that for, for farmers and there's so much to learn from, from that piece and to try and build it on those uh, kind of thinking outside the box a little bit in terms of how do we get more financial literacy programs and more business management, business skills uh, programs into the equine sector at large kind of thing. So yeah, I think that was a great point from Sean and then also everybody else as well. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And a great segue to what will be our my last question before we move into the question and answer. But I would like to to sort of come full circle to to where we started in terms of business business fundamentals. And I and I really like how we've been discussing <clears throat> relationships among people. Um, we've been talking about opportunities, creating and making them. We've been talking about the relationship between horses' well-being and business success. So I would invite each of you in sort of 30 seconds or less. Is there a fundamental back to basics practice or principle that you think we in our busy day to day lives or in the complexities of the equine industry we forget that needs to we want to shine a light on it let's not forget X as a business fundamental or business practice I would invite any or all of you to just to comment in 30 seconds or less on that but basics we might miss or neglect that really should be revived. Keeping this to 30 seconds or less is going to be tough doctor uh look i had a lot of wealthy clients in florida and they were kings and queens of their industry they were very respectable people um but for some reason my little ego thought to make myself more superior to them because i'm their daughter's horse trainer um so you're going to talk about relationships some of the best relationships you have are with the parents of your writing students and cherish those and embrace them and take time to get to know them um again some of these people you know outside of the barn like they're they think i'm really smart i kind of fake it till i make it um because i'm teaching their daughter to perform in a show ring if i were to go see them at their place of occupation or you know most of them are business owners i'd be in awe of them so i i think we tend to get into our little space in the barn and 
don't take the time to really get to know the parents, the clients, as well as we should, and really show them the respect that they deserve, because most of them are pretty impressive people outside of the barn. I wish I had done that better. And in hindsight, man, I could, it would be great because they're, they're wonderful people. The people that hang out at the barn all the time, the parents that hang out and watch their kids ride six days a week, those are quality people. Become friends with them. Yeah, I'm going to segue a bit off what Sean said, uh, meeting those people. For us, it's been about growing our team, admitting there's things we don't know and bringing in the experts to help us when we do. Um, there's lots of mistakes we make. Uh, every time we make a mistake, we call that our tuition. We're learning as we go, just like everyone else in this industry. But there are experts who actually know the answers to some of these things. And don't be afraid to ask people for help. There are people who've spent their life dedicated to whatever it is you might be struggling with. So you can bring them in and make them part of your team and, and work with them. And sometimes it's the parents in the barn. <laughs> I was just going to say something similar to Helen is to know what you don't know and to bring in those skill sets. And uh, so for myself, numbers and business management, sorry, Sean, it's not my thing, but I do uh, for my own, my own consulting company and I employ three people and we have uh, a really good team going. And so making sure you understand kind of what, what I'm good at versus what some of my team members are good at and then what skills are gap are or a gap in the company. So accounting, I hire an accountant. So trying to make sure you understand what you're good at personally, what your team members are good at, and then finding those resources in the community that can help. And, and there's a lot of free resources in most uh, communities as well. Some business startup company or uh, organizations at your local municipality. So if you're an entrepreneur and you've got an idea for a horse business, it doesn't even have to involve horses. If you want to make a new type of a uh, riding shirt or a new helmet or something, there's industry professionals and, and resources in your communities you can tap into. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. That's okay. Carl, do you have a concise answer? It'll be quick. Um, you know what, we did a lot of work the last couple of years at the University of Bridgetown Guelph with Laura Flanagan and actually hired two people from the courses. And, and one was very interesting because she had taken the first year course out there for equine management and then left the field because she couldn't find a job due to COVID. She had something set up. She ends up now being the horse ID at Woodbine, um, I believe in the in the youth, getting youth involved. So there's all these kids in the University of Guelph. Hope Long's got another great program for internships. You know what? They're there. They want to work in the industry. Get them working, and they bring new ideas and fresh ideas. Many of them, and let's not lose them. Let's get them working, and let's get them into the industry so that it continues to prosper. Wonderful. That's Thank me. you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Coulter. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Coulter and all the panelists, Bronwyn Wilton, Helen Richardson, Sean Jones, and Carl Lagerberg for such a fruitful discussion. Unique perspectives from each panelist offered such great insight on what makes a successful business. Now we will open up the floor for any questions for our Q&A. Feel free to use the chat for questions you may have. To reiterate, please note that rude or offensive comments will not be tolerated. Take it away, Dr. Coulter. Thank you, Hannah. I think I'm going to start with the slightly easier one that's appeared, and then we'll ease our way back into a slightly more challenging question. What is one thing the equine industry does right when it comes to business fundamentals? I know Carl and uh, Sean and Helen probably have more insights on this particular one, but I can tell you one thing they do right is spend money. Uh, so the, the equine industry is actually a, a pretty important economic uh, driver in Canada. So for the study, we had that the equine sector contributes $24.21 billion to the Canadian economy in 2022. So it's a pretty impressive number. And there's a lot of uh, peripheral uh, spin-off economic impacts and uh, good things that uh, the equine sector does across the country. So so yeah, it is an important uh, sector. So I think if, uh, as from a business perspective, maybe Carl and uh, Sean and Helen can jump in now. I thought I'd share that just to get the conversation going there. I'm going to add something really quick to what Bronwyn just said is, uh, you know, there's a map. And it shows a horse at the center and it shows all the jobs and the economic impact across Ontario. It was just set for Ontario, but you think of it across Canada. Every single horse leads to X number of jobs in the industry. And then you have the hay and the straw man. Then you've got the car dealership that sells the, the vehicles, the new horse vans and everything. It just continues to grow. And as long as it's doing well, it, it's economically, it's opens it up for the entire world to just continue going forward, right? 
And I was told a number the other day, 30,000 horses in um, BC. And I had no clue about that, only having worked in the uh, thoroughbred industry. It just goes to show you there's horses everywhere and everybody wants to be involved. And I think it's something that we need to continue to grow with the people on this panel that just are doing amazing things. And I can't stress enough how people need to talk to someone like Sean and have a financial plan so they can continue to make money. Yes, absolutely. Well, in the, the, the recent report that Bronwyn co-led and co writ has given us a lot of uh, data, often we're li lacking numbers. That's a problem. I discussed this the other night. Around the world, horse people have um, frustrations with the lack of data and the lack of, st lack of statistics um, about horse horses uh, numerically, but also in terms of horse activities. And so I think that that's, an, um, you've identified something, Carl, there, which is as well that we're, we're building our understanding, we're building knowledge. Um, and that's something that um, horse people are doing well, that's fueling uh, a host of possible benefits. Would others like to answer the what we're doing right question? I think I see Helen. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit from a sport point of view. So working in sport, I tend to talk to a lot of other sports and people in sport. And the one thing that I always hear from them is that horse people are very passionate. We're more passionate than skiers and than hockey players. Maybe sometimes we really have this emotional bond and relationship with the horse that you wouldn't see a snowboarder have with their snowboard or a cross country skier with their boots. So uh, sometimes that gets in our way, and it's a very North American thing. I think if you looked at the industry in other parts of the world, you'd see a little bit different, but we tend to be very passionate, and we really work to, uh, in most of the, the barns that I know, we're, we're always advocating for our horses, and we're working to create a good environment for them and for the people that are coming into the sport. So passion is very strong in this industry, good or bad. <laughs> Um, like Helen, I, I kind of like the idea of talking more about the sport rather than the industry, because that's sort of my area of expertise is, um, look, in, in a world now where uh, you get instant gratification from almost everything, there's something to be said for spending four hours at the barn. Um, and I've always sort of appreciated that about the sport. There's a sense of discipline. There's a sense of commitment that doesn't exist. Um, you know, my sons, for instance, will go play soccer. You know, they play soccer for an hour, score a goal, and they're done. You know, my daughter goes to the barn. She's there for five hours, grooming, building relationships, so on and so forth. It's it's more than just that instant gratification. So overall, you know, as long as we continue to embrace that part, uh, that's what the sport is doing right. I still keep track of a lot of my students from 15, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. Um, and they're, you know, they all went to great schools. They all have great careers. They built great lives for themselves because of the discipline and the fundamentals that they learned from being in the barn every day. So as long as the industry continues to create that environment, that's what it's doing right. Excellent. Thank you all. A reminder to folks, if you have your own questions, feel free to direct them to Emma or Bellin in the, in the chat. The more complex one is here, waiting, tapping. A lot of people are grappling with this idea of raising prices. Now, Sean mentioned it. People have obviously considered it. And they're, they're, they're weighing and considering the benefits in terms of providing horse care, paying staff, etc., with the access question in terms of it, will this be limiting access to higher income folks. They recognize it's, this is complicated um, and are, are wondering if any of you want to elaborate on that, have any advice on how to navigate that or, or find that balance. Sean certainly does, but once Sean has spoken, I invite others to weigh in if they would like. This is my favorite topic. I love it. And and it's it's hard. It's hard for, for people to understand this, but I'm going to be a little blunt here. Um, we have to stop being the altruistic starving artist victim, plain and simple. You are in business. Start thinking like a business owner. Don't be so afraid to increase your rates. Let's say your lessons, your, your writing lessons are 50 bucks a lesson. Um, I would suggest, or let's say they're 60 bucks a lesson. I would say, go up 50% tomorrow go up to ninety dollars and then you're going to say well sean i'm going to lose 20 percent of my clients right off the bat 
Well, guess what? You just freed up 20% more time. You're making more money. Now you can devote more time to those clients that stayed to do a better job. Maybe you can devote more time to create another revenue generating project. So look, the, the fact of the matter, my wife was talking about this the other day. She wanted to get a facial. A facial is $150. You know, I can get three riding lessons for that. And I don't, and the, the facial store doesn't poop doesn't eat, doesn't break fences, doesn't need shoes. You know, so we have to stop being the starving artist. We are in business to make money. I know we love horses. I know we love riding. I know we love the sport. What's not to love except for the profit margins? That's what I hate. So what I was talking about yesterday on my talk is you must get to a 70% operational cost ratio. Your revenue equals x your operational costs need to be 70 percent of that or less people are saying it's impossible it's hard it's not impossible learn to be comfortable raising the rates now look if you want to talk about raising rates you can't just slap it on next month's invoice you know what i mean but what i did i i increased my board rate 50 percent overnight but i also had a barn party first fed everybody had some adult beverages, talked about all their accomplishments in the last show season, talked about what we're going to do and add value for the next circuit. There's a lot of things that we can do as professionals to add value to a client's experience that don't cost us anything. That's a great way to justify a rate increase. So please look at inflation. All of your costs have gone up. I went to buy tires for my truck. Two years ago, those tires were $1,800. Now they're $2,700. For tires, you know what I mean? But your board rates haven't gone up in however long. Your lesson rates haven't gone up in however long. Keep up with inflation at least, but try to get to that 70% cost threshold and don't be afraid of losing clients. And look, it's not your job as the equine professional to make easy entry into the sport. Let's leave that up to Helen at OE and and Equine Canada and Guelph to figure that stuff out. Don't take the burden on yourself as an independent operator. You don't have to make this sport easy entry for everybody. You have to be profitable. Otherwise, you're going to go out of business, death by a thousand cuts, slowly. That's Helen, what I can talk about this forever. Sorry, I'll yeah. let this, someone else talk. I would lo- Helen, I would love to hear your perspective. Yeah, so I'm going to uh, take from the... Some of the things Sean was saying, communication with the boarders, if you're going to do those things, communication is the key to doing them successfully. And I think as well, just making sure that you're communicating why you're doing the things you're doing. One of the things that we used to do when we were younger, my sister and I coach at the facility, my her husband is the farm manager, my mom does the books, it's a very family business. Um, we didn't value our own time very well. We vet, we recognize that when we're teaching a lesson, standing in the middle of the ring, that's time that they're paying for. But we found we were spending at least as much time standing in the barn, answering questions about what shows should I go to? What kind of bandage should I put on my horse? What should I do with this? What should I do with that? And we started realizing the more you don't value yourself, the less your clients think they need to pay you for the experience and the, the knowledge and time you have. So we actually started Uh, putting a number on that time and saying, listen, if you want to talk about your show season, we are more than happy to plan that with you and sit down and do it. It's going to be a one-on-one meeting and it's going to cost you the same as a lesson. And we're going to schedule the time and we're going to do it efficiently like any other professional. If I went to see a lawyer, they wouldn't talk to me for half an hour before they started billing me. They'd bill me from the minute I got in the door. And we need to think of ourselves that way. We've got the experience and the knowledge, and we need to act like professionals and value ourselves as well. It doesn't mean you're nickel and diming for every single thing, but it means you have to value the time you're spending and the knowledge that you're giving when you're giving it to those clients. Kendra, if I could just pick up on uh, kind of what Sean was saying there um, in terms of it's not the individual business person's job to make horses accessible to people. I think it is up to the sector 
somehow to figure out how to make horses accessible to people um, and the question Canada and those types of organizations, just like Hockey Canada deals with how do, the rising costs. So how do we make sure there's still programs to make hockey accessible to little kids across the country? S soccer Canada has similar issues. Um, uh, well, soccer is one of the better sports for that, but Tennis Canada and some of the other ones have issues with that. So how can the sector take on that responsibility in terms of working with different government programs, different uh, uh, foundations and charitable organizations. How do you, cause if we know that horses are good for people and they're good for kids with uh, mental health issues and social well being, those types of things for kids and adults and a lot of equine therapy programs are really good, but how can the equestrian sector the or at the organizational level uh, work on that? So I just, as a corollary kind of to, yes, I agree, <laughs> raise your rights, raise your rates. Uh, make sure you're acting as a business person on your individual business, but then as a kind of sector, how do we kind of still make, find space to make the horses accessible to, to people who need them. So be a little bit of a different angle to that, but definitely not up to each individual business person to go broke trying to make sure they're offering that for, for the local community. Yeah. And I'm going to, I'm going to jump in for a second if that's okay. Um, I mean, there are lots of different ways that people are running equestrian businesses in Canada and in Ontario. There are, you know, boarding barns that are solely focused on competition. There are riding schools, there are trail riding facilities. There are lots of different ways. There's racing, lots of different ways people are involved. And there really are different opportunities within those programs um, to, to provide different experiences for people with horses. I think because I work in a performance barn where we're focused on competition and that's Sean's background, that's sort of the angle we've come at with the professional discussion. Mm -hmm. There are programs, and I'll, uh, I'm going to say it again, <laughs> like Rookie Riders, which is being introduced in schools, um, in recreation centers, in summer camps, where kids are introduced to all of the parts of riding without actually needing to use very many horses that can provide those opportunities to have those initial experiences at a much lower cost in much larger groups and give those really beginner riding schools that are giving that entry into the sport and teaching those safe fundamental skills and developmental physical literacy that's needed to engage in the sport at the level you want to. Those programs exist, but right now, we don't have enough people who are fully aware of how to use them, how to incorporate them into their programs and how to use them to grow their own program and to provide those opportunities. And I think a little bit, it's partly because we've done things one way for so long. You know, we run a summer camp and every kid gets a horse and that's their horse for the whole day. Well, that's a lot of horses and a lot of exhaustion for staff and for the facility to do a summer camp that way. We're trying to promote new ways of doing those things to provide those entry opportunities so that people can engage in the sport, but also provide the pathway to get to competitive sport or to recreational sport or to just long term athlete in the sport. And I think uh, working with the different associations, working with the different groups that exist, some of those programs have been developed to fill those needs and partly because of the pandemic and other things that have happened uh, through our province and through our country in the last few years, it's been difficult to get engaged in those programs. As we get back to doing more in person, we're seeing more engagement. Uh, we took 10 rookie rider barrels to the Royal. So if you were at the Royal Winter Fair, you saw this crazy section at the back of the Royal with lineups of little kids who wanted to get on and ride a horse and figure out how to get on and get off and move around on a horse without actually being introduced to a real horse. By the end, they were ready to go have that first experience somewhere. I think there are lots of programs like that that have been developed and that are being developed. And again, we just need to communicate and share those ideas so that we can get people into those safe, comfortable first experiences so that they can continue forward in the sport. Thank you, Helen. Thank you all. Lots for people to think about, lots of food for thought there. A few related questions. I'm going to try to hold them together uh, into something that makes sense. So there, there, is, there was some questions about some of the um, employment standards and employment fundamentals. So things like job descriptions and pay and interviewing practices and professionalizing those. Um, and I'd like to let everyone know we had an excellent discussion about some of those dimensions. Uh, I spoke a lot about those on Tuesday evening and I believe all of these sessions are being recorded. Um, so if you want to get 
the perspective of uh, uh, an, an, an equestrian researcher and, and, and management studies professor, uh, which is me. Uh, you can see the recordings uh, from Tuesday in that respect. But I believe that that's a nice segue to this to the core of these this these this constellation of questions, and they relate to things that I think are fundamentally about the people's rights. So the rights of people, whether they're athletes or workers in this industry. So how do we ensure that things about safe sport are uh, are being taken seriously? But also on the question of youth, you know, building from, from what Helen has just said, how do folks ensure that um, young people see that this is an industry with viable career paths and that they're not just gonna be paid under the table, they're not um, just gonna be not paid at all, uh, how do we ensure practices and businesses are, are showing uh, everyone respect, whether they're athletes and or workers? I'm going to jump back in. I like to talk. Can you tell? Um, <laughs> so wearing my Equestrian Canada OE hat, I'm going to talk about safe sport for a second. Uh, this industry is a little bit of a funny industry. It, unlike other sports, it tends to happen only on private property. It's very rare that it happens on a public facility property. So things like certified coaching, which are taken for granted and have been in place in some sports for 30, 35 years, are relatively, uh, they're not new because I got certified 30 years ago, but they are new to a lot of people in the industry. They, um, and they've been quite optional in the past we've sort of evolved to the point that if you take your child to swimming lessons, you assume that that coach is certified and trained because they're working in the public pool, they couldn't get the job if they weren't. There is an assumption that parents have gone past sort of even asking for, is the facility, has the facility been checked by anyone? Is the coach certified? Do you have insurance? Have you, you know, done police background checks? Have you done all the things that we would expect if we were to go to the public pool or to the public skating rink? And so there's really a little bit of education that has to happen to educate the community that they need to be looking for those standards and things like the coach status program that EC is putting into place uh, right now only affects the field of play and coaches coaching there. And it's a struggle because it's only in that one sector of the industry, which is a very small part of our industry. It only affects the Olympic disciplines. It's only in sanctioned sports. So we've got um, a, a larger group of coaches moving towards education and training for the role that they're in. Um, and the same thing is happening with all of the other roles that happen in the sports side of the industry, but it, it really isn't happening industry wide yet. And that's something that uh, between insurance and and really parents looking for that background to provide the safe experience needs to happen so that over the next few years, people will become more accountable to actually do the education and, and engage in those programs so that when somebody has an issue, that can be reported to a governing body who can do something about it. And right now we're sort of in this weird gray area where we've got, we, we are very much like golf. We run mostly on private property, so we make our own rules and we need to start thinking like other industries and other sports and in other agricultural sectors and in other livestock sectors and in other sports. We, we wouldn't have the free reign that we've always had. And while it's difficult to get everybody to agree that they need to be part of this level playing field, it's also vitally important for our industry. Would anyone else like to weigh in on that? Adding to what Helen's saying, you know, I, I truly believe that um, like through the job track, the job board at Guelph, all these places that are available for you to look for jobs, um, you know what, they they check out a, a lot of these things and they tick all the boxes of making sure that there's workman's comp involved, the pay scales. Um, the young people entering the, the industry, they need to be prepared to ask those questions. I mean, sometimes they're a hard question. You may go into a place and think it's an amazing place. And then, you know, you say, okay, well, what is your pay scale? What's the W? You know, you ask those questions and you can at least gauge of where you want to be. Um, I know from my own experience, when I was younger, there were stables that paid, they paid cash and there were stables that paid on the books, you know, all your taxes taken off. And, and to me, at the end of the day, that was where I wanted to be because you want to have that Canada pension plan at the end of your working life, right? If you have nothing else, at least have that. 
And uh, you know what, it's just a, a thing that's very important to make sure that when you're looking for that job, you're getting the right job. But when it comes to money, it's something that we need, you know, I was going to say before is that um, we need to ensure that we're paying better. And as Sean said about, you know, you're charging more, all that comes to play because at the end of the day, you know, when you're fighting to like, where do you make the choice? Am I going to work in, in the equine industry? Or am I going to work at McDonald's? Nothing wrong with working at McDonald's. I did it when I was a young man, right? I think everybody started there at some time, boy. But at the end of the day, in order to get these people, we have to pay better and we have to ensure that our, all the safe practices are being met. So a little bit like Helen, I, I was a certified trainer 30 years ago um, when I was 18. So now you can do that math. I was the very first marketing coordinator for the Ontario Equestrian Federation at the time. And one of the things I was truly passionate about was establishing standards for equine operations as a whole. And it started out with what we uh, created, what was called the Industry Advisory Council. And what we wanted to do was uh, something that Helen's working on right now with the stables program. We just never got there because I was young, naive, and didn't know what to do. And the sport was resistant to change. So I think we're going the right direction. But one of my things that I was always hoping for being a newly certified trainer was that everybody should be a uh, certified trainer. And then you go to a horse show and you see all these top trainers out there. And why do they need to be certified? You know, so I had always sort of proposed the idea, why don't we just grandfather in the big name trainers so that they, we can at least say they're trainers um, to get to the process going. But I really like the idea of creating a certification program, almost almost mandated. I know we, we don't like to say that word too much, but like Helen said, everything is done on private property and we have to have a little bit more intervention from the industries and or from the, the representatives involved, whether it be OE, uh, Guelph, or Equine Canada, um, to, to make all this stuff happen for peace of mind for the parents, like you said. On another topic, I'm a big fan of safe sport. I know it's it's a bit controversial down in the States, um, but man, it's I'd feel a whole lot better knowing that you know the people that I'm dropping my daughter off to have gone through this program, have been vetted uh, completely, and have to do this every year. Um, we're so late getting to that, uh, but I'm glad we're finally getting to that. And I'm excited to see what Helen's going to do with the stables program and, and take that further. Absolutely. Well, and I can confirm that in Sweden, um, coaches need to be certified if they're going to be coaching competition students. You're not permitted to be, have students at competitions and, unless you're certified with the Swedish Equestrian Federation. We are winding our time down, but there's one last question that comes from more from a consumer's perspective, which I think is helpful because some members of our audience may not yet be active in the industry or maybe participants or athletes within it. Um, and it, the question is whether there are official guidelines for newcomers to the sport on what board lessons, training, cost, you could maybe even expand it to say barriers or, or things like that. And would it help if there were um, guidelines of that kind that for example said a lesson barn you might expect costs of this much at a high level competition coach you might expect costs of this kind do those exist and if not would they be valuable i feel like helen is going to answer that's helen's wheelhouse <laughs> <laughs> oh oh me again okay um actually it the we had a group of students at equine guelph last year work on a project to identify the entry into the sport costs throughout the province so they identified and brought back a report to OE on uh, how much it costs to get into English and Western in, uh, they divided the province into Northeast, Northwest, Southeast and Southwest, and what lesson fees were, what the initial purchase of boots and a helmet and that kind of thing were. And we've redeveloped that into a one page uh, flyer that we give out to parents, to new parents. We provide it for facilities to hand out to prospective parents um, and we give it out during ticket to ride events so when we're doing anything public where we're inviting kids to come and meet horses for the first time and it breaks down sort of the cost of the sport and in comparison with a lot of other sports that that students do so we do have some information on that from an ontario perspective just that in the thoroughbred world you can actually talk to the HEPA, horsemen's Pre uh, benevolent protective association 
and get information. Various trainers will uh, allow them to give out their phone number and you can discuss how much they charge and overall pricing. Uh, the CTHS, Canadian Thoroughbred Horse Society, they actually try to start up partnerships to get people involved in racing. And again, we'll give you the pricing of how much it costs to train a horse every day and farrier uh, medications because, you know, they, they get their virus, like biosecurity, as Bronwyn mentioned earlier, they're always, they're always up to date on their viral shots. Um, Ontario Racing has done a great program of trying to get owners into the into the racing. And Woodbine, Martha Wakeley is uh, right now manager of racing operations and horseman's concierge. And she does a great job on her end on the thoroughbred side and Megan Walker on the standard bed side. You can call them and get information about horse ownership. They can't tell you what trainer to go to, but they again, they can give you the idea of how much it's going to cost you per month and how it get, how you can get into horse ownership uh getting your license through the agco so there is a lot of a lot of information a lot of groups out there trying to get people in the, the thoroughbred horse racing industry and standard breads and i believe that there's somebody on on the quarter horse but i just i wouldn't know the name right off the hand well i should take this opportunity to thank all four of you for your time for your insights for your commitment uh, we're winding down here, um, but I know you've given the audience a lot to think about wherever they're positioned vis-a-vis -vis horses and vis-a-vis -vis these industries. Um, so sincere thanks. It's been, a, it's been a pleasure moderating you, and I will now hand it back to Hannah. Again, a big, big thank you to our amazing panelists, Bronwyn Wilton, Helen Richardson, Sean Jones, and Carl Lagerberg, and thank you to our wonderful facilitator, Dr. Kendra Coulter. It was amazing hearing the different perspectives and tips for running a successful business. This was a perfect opportunity to learn from the best in the industry, and there's much to take away. Thank you again to our sponsors, Acera Insurance, Equine Guelph, Smart Cert, The Rider, Slaza Saddlery, Canadian Horse Journals, and KX Radio for making this night possible. And thank you to all the attendees for taking time to share in this experience. Thank you to the students and the organizing committee for this amazing night. A reminder that a recording of each night of the Equine Industry Symposium will be available on the BBRM Equine Management YouTube channel. Before you go, we encourage you to complete our brief feedback survey, which will appear as a link in the chat and a QR code. Those that do will be entered for a chance to win a free saddle fitting thanks to Schleza Saddlery and a gift certificate towards a Smart Cert massage course. Sadly, this brings us to the end of the 8th Annual Equine Industry Symposium. I hope you enjoyed it and we are hoping to see you again next year. Have a great, great night.